Well, it's been lovely to be with you over this weekend, and uh, it's a real joy to travel around the country and to see, meet lots of wonderful people like you in our churches across the nation. Jesus has a plan for his church, and um, there isn't a plan B in case it doesn't work. He's only got one plan, and you're it. Oh, you look excited about that. <laughs> You're it. It's amazing, isn't it? Just think about the realities of that, that God could have chosen to do anything in the earth and he chooses to work through us, ordinary people, to do extraordinary things. And I want to just for these next few moments, just encourage you around those extraordinary things that the Lord wants to do. Because everything in us wants us to contextualize our faith in an ordinary way. Because we're ordinary. All of us are ordinary people. And yet, there's something beyond the ordinary that God calls us to. He doesn't call us to just gather together in lovely conference centers like this or lovely church buildings like you have, to sing songs, to make some new friends, and just to go on with our week as was, just with a little bit of happiness in our life because of our connection. He wants us as a church to encourage one another, to sharpen one another, to do extraordinary things despite our ordinariness that's his plan and I've seen people across the nation and across the world believe that even though it goes against everything instinctively within them and no matter what your background what your age what your circumstance no matter how ordinary you think you are I want you to hear this really clearly today God wants to do extraordinary things through you there's a word that we sometimes use called amen and it means I agree. God wants to do extraordinary things through you. Amen. You've got it. You've got it. If we can make that much progress in those first few sentences, what are we going to be like by the end of the sermon? Do you know, I, I, I've been amazed um, that God would ever want to work through me. I, I didn't have a privileged background. I didn't grow up in a ministry house. I didn't even grow up in Elim. In fact, I got turned down for Elim ministry the first time I applied. And now I'm the general superintendent. How does that happen? I always think it's a bit like driver, drivers. You know, the best drivers fail their first test. Maybe that's, maybe that's what's happened here. But I've never really had that sense of being very much. And yet, I can honestly say that God has done things that are beyond my capabilities simply because I've said yes to him. That's all it takes. To move from being ordinary to extraordinary, all it takes is that one word, yes. There's an alternative that you can use. It's slightly shorter, one letter shorter, begins with N, ends in O. And I find that many people don't dare say no to God. But I find that there is a middle answer that they give that is neither yes nor no, it's not yet. They delay, they do the metaphorical snooze on the alarm clock. We defer it for another nine minutes longer and we say maybe when I'm not ready yet God but I will be ready so ask again in another, another period of time and my life will be better and I, I find that young people think well I don't really know what my life's about so wait for me to get my education and then when I get my education then I'll say yes then they get their education and it's like actually I need to get a career now when I start getting a career I know what my future's about then I'll say yes and then they meet someone and they get married and they say well actually we're in a new relationship now now. So give me a little bit longer, God, and then I'll say yes. And then, of course, kids come along, and then kids like, it's got it, now is not a good time. So give me a little bit longer, and then I'll say yes. And then the kids grow up into teenagers, and you thought the first stage was hard. This stage is even harder. And you say, God, they're teenagers now. Have you seen them? Not yet. Not yet, God. Give me a little, when they leave home, then we'll do it. And then they leave home, and by your career is now going bananas. And you think, God, we're in the middle of a really inconvenient moment. Not yet. Yet. And then you get to retirement and you think, well, I don't really have the energy I used to have, God. And I don't really have the ability to put my time into this. And I'm old now. I don't have any hair any longer. How can you use me? And then before we realize it, we get to the end of our life and 
we've missed all those moments and we realize it's too late. And by the way, if you've still got breath in your lungs, it's not too late. It's not too late. But it's also not too early. And God speaks to his church today and he says, I want to do extraordinary things through your life today. Not tomorrow, but today. There's a story in Acts 16. I'm going to read you a few verses from it. The backdrop is that the disciples, the apostles did something, Paul and Silas did something that um, caused a bit of a stir in the city where they were. They cast a demon out of someone who was telling the fortunes of people and the people who owned this slave girl were offended that they'd now lost their source of income through this deceptive spirit that had been in this girl and so they had Paul and Silas locked up. And you recognize, I'm sure many of you, these next few verses. And it says, about midnight... Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. You know, there are times when you have to do things that the people around you don't understand. You have to do things at the most inconvenient of moments. I'm sure Paul and Silas, after a stressful day, would have loved to put their head on a pillow and go to sleep. And I'm sure their resident prisoners would have loved them to have done the same. But instead, they were singing. We've taken on a new building with Exeter in Exeter Church. We've taken on a former range and a Matalan store. And uh, they're massive facilities, 66,000 square foot. And the health and safety people or the environmental health people were going a little bit nuts at us before we took the building on. And they were trying to stop it from happening, stop us from getting change of use because of the noise that we would make in this community. And they put a limit on us that we weren't allowed to go beyond 10 o'clock at night with our amplified music. But we got an exception and we got an exception for Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve that we can put the music on late into the night, the early hours of the morning. But people will try and control when you can do certain things. The society will try to condition the church and say, you have to stay and do it in this corner, in this way at this time. And Paul and Silas were having none of it. So let's read again about midnight. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. They had no choice. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened And everyone's chains came loose. Oh, now they've got their attention. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out in a loud voice, don't harm yourself because we're all here. How did Paul manage to do that? Like these guys, they would have run for it, surely. How did he manage to keep them all together? Don't harm yourself because we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in the house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and all his family were baptized. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. What a few hours. What a transformative moment. And that's what an extraordinary God can do. He can transform situations that feel hopeless. Here we had two disciples that were in a situation which really they could have spent all of their time sending letters of protest to the MPs to the Roman guards, this is so unjust, this is so unfair, wait till you see my lawyer in the morning. They could have spent all their time wallowing and saying, we're just trying to follow Jesus, how are we ended up in this place, this is not fair. They could have spent all their time protesting, complaining, having a go, putting their fist up at God, say, God, how did you even allow this to happen? They could have spent all of their time doing that, but they didn't. They had a focus, and their focus was that no matter what's happening in the world, God is good. And he is worthy of our praise. And I believe that there's a resilience that's coming on the body of Christ. That the realities are that we've become a little bit weak as Christians. Oh, if I don't feel like going to church today, I'm going to have a morning in. Feel like going to church. 
Can I be honest with you? I'm the pastor. And there are times I don't feel like going to church. <laughs> I was way too enthusiastic, Adam. Like, you're not the only one that feels or doesn't feel like going to church at times. I'm sure Daniel didn't feel like praying at the window. I'm sure there are times when Paul and Silas didn't feel like worshipping. But the question is, not whether we feel like it, but is God worthy of it? And a church that's strong, a church that is powerful in the Lord, is not a church that's governed by its feelings. It's a church that's governed by the truth. And come what may, do to us whatever you want to do to us, but I'm not relinquishing my God. In fact, bring it on. I always remember there's a story of the church I was in in Derby, not too far away from here. And the story was that Wynne Lewis, one of the former GSs of Elim, when he planted the Derby church, I think it was in the 1960s, that he was, it was a pretty new formative church and he'd gathered a group of people. And one night that there was a guest speaker on in the city in another church. And half of the people who were part of this church plant went to hear the guest speaker and didn't come to the church. Wynne Lewis gathered them all downstairs in the basement of Derby City Church. If you've ever been there, you recognize underground, there are pillars that are holding the upper floor. And he pointed these pillars. He said, do you know what this church needs? This church needs pillars. He said, you lot are like caterpillars. You go off chasing every little bit of lettuce that comes. But we need pillars, not caterpillars. You know, I believe that God is calling ordinary people to do extraordinary things by being pillars who will be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, that will know that no weapon formed against them will prosper, who will know that if God is for us, who can be against us? And you say, well, there's a lot of people against us. There's a lot of people who don't like us. There's a lot of people who are wanting the downfall of the church. There is a lot of public opinion that doesn't like what we believe any longer. But if God is for us, who can be against us? And we can lift up our voices and lift up our praise. And even in the midst of the storm, as that song says, we can sing a hallelujah because he is worthy of our praise. You know, I find that... Um, I find that our attention spans in life are pretty short. The average sermon is 30 to 40 minutes, but the average attention span is about seven. I don't know what you do for the other 30 minutes of the sermon. In fact, in my record, I've now lost you. Our attention spans are easily diverted. We've got used to levels of dopamine, keeping us fascinated by our smartphones and our tablets. Our attention span has got shorter and churches need to work harder to keep people's attention. Even as I'm talking, everybody's looking around the room and proving my point. Thank you for the illustration. We have to work harder so churches become more entertaining. We do things in shorter sections to try to keep you on track. But actually, the issue shouldn't be about how we design our services. It should be about how fascinated we are by God. And I pray that I will be a follower of Jesus. I pray that you will be a follower of Jesus as fascinated by God. And for these next few moments, I want to share with you how you and I can know a breakthrough in our praise because I believe that praise is not something we do because we feel like it. It's something that steps away from the short attention spans of our humanity and it reaches into the eternal and it stands around the throne of grace along with the elders and the angels worshipping and bowing and it invites us to a place of revelation. And it's a fascinating thing, the topic of praise in the scriptures, because as you know, 
the Bible wasn't written in English. It was originally written in Welsh, I reckon, but anyway, they adapted it years later to Hebrew and Greek. But there are some words that we translate into English that have multiple that have multiple words in the Hebrew language or in the Greek language. For example, you might know that we have the one word love, which is fairly inadequate. Because somebody can say, I love Mars bars, and they can say they love their wife. And I hope that there's a slight distinction about the value of both of those things. I hope you didn't mean the same thing. And so we have one word in English, but in Hebrew there will be, and Greek, there will be different words that give different weights and different strengths. English is sometimes an inadequate language to communicate things. And that's true with the word praise. Because we have the word praise and, and the word worship and the words thanksgiving littered throughout the scriptures, hundreds and hundreds of references. But when you go back to the original Hebrew, there's a fascinating understanding about what the Bible is saying. Let me unpack this word praise for you. The most common used Hebrew word for praise is a word called halal. It's used more than any other Hebrew word for praise. It's where we derive the word hallelujah from. What you might be fascinated to know is what halal means. Get ready for this. It means to be over the top. It means to be foolish. It means to lord or to celebrate or to be clamorously foolish. When Nita and I first met, she was um, from Kidderminster and I was from Wales. And so I went to visit her one weekend in Kidderminster. She was staying at her mum's home and I was staying at a friend's home. The distance between those two places was about two and a half miles. And one evening we went to Nita's life group at her home church, which was probably at about a mile away from Nita's home and about three and a half miles away from where I was staying. And at the end of the life group, we had a really lovely evening. Somebody said to us, would you like a lift back to where you're staying? Both of us. I thought about it for a moment. I thought, if we have a lift back, I'm going to be with her just five more minutes. If I walk back, I'm going to have the joy of being with her longer. It was a dark winter's night. And I looked at this man who was offering us a lift. I said, it's okay, we'll walk, thank you. And then we began the walk on this cold, dark, slightly damp night. And I got to spend a wonderful extra period of time with Nita. And I took her to the gate and I shook her hand and I said, waved her goodbye. <laughs> and then I thought, I've got two and a half miles to walk back to where I'm staying. <laughs> but it was worth it. Like, it didn't make sense. A lift would be more convenient. A lift would have caused me not to have been slightly concerned about walking in these dark lanes by myself at night. But that's what love does. It makes decisions that don't always make sense. And I, I love that um, every year we tend to take our church community out into the center of Exeter. We did it on Palm Sunday this year and hundreds of the church gathered in the city center, worshiping. They weren't standing there with their hymn sheets, looking respectable. They were looking very unrespectable. They were being very over the top. They were clamorously foolish. And people were stopping and going, what is this? These people look like they are either crazy or in love. Actually, both is true. We are crazy in love. Because God loves us. And I... You know, I, I think if I went to a football ground and I saw all the supporters in the stands, that when a goal was scored, they just sat there and go, hmm. I'd probably think, I'm not sure these are real fans. 
I'm not sure these really care about the result of this game. That actually the demonstrative nature of the expression of those fans would let me know how much they love the team. In Exeter, we don't have a big football team necessarily. We might get six, 7,000 people to the home games. But there's one area, because they're in sort of one of the lower divisions, where there's no seats. And about 3,000 people stand in that end terrace. My son, who's a big football fan, if I offer him a free seat that sometimes I get given in the main stand that's got an extra half an inch of thickness padding on the seats and hospitality, and we get a meal at a half time and all those sort of things, if I sometimes give him an offer of one of those, he says no because he wants to be in the stand with the real fans. He said, they, Dad, they all look across at you eating cucumber sandwiches and they think, oh, they're just those corporate people, you know? They're not really interested in the game. They just come for the experience. They're not real supporters. And you look over in the terrace and they are, they've got drums and they've got biggest flags and they sing for the entire game and they are nuts for their team. They travel all over the country because they love the team. And it's really evident to look at them that they love their team. And I wonder whether people looked at Paul and Silas and thought, these people love Jesus. We're hearing them sing these hymns and these words. They don't have to do this. They're not obliged to do this. In fact, it's inconvenient to do this. But they must love their Savior. And halal is this. It's that evidence that some people might say, you're foolish. You remember David when the Ark of the Covenant returned? He stripped off and he danced. And his wife said, you are foolish. And I believe that there's a time coming for ordinary church to do extraordinary things and that there is a call upon these ordinary people doing extraordinary things to reflect the worship of an extraordinary God in an extraordinary way, a demonstrative way that declares God. Yes, amen. That there's some scriptures, if I give you the Psalm 113, verse 3, it says, From the rising of the sun, you all know the scripture, to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be halaled. From sunrise to sunset, the Lord's name is to be clamorously, foolishly, over the toply praised. Sometimes in our gathering in Exeter, we'll talk about the nations of the world, that the sun rose around Fiji and New Zealand, and as it's risen around the world, different churches across the time zones have taken their opportunity to be among those that from the rising of the sun to the going on the same, the Lord's name is to be halal, to be praised, to be honored and glorified. And I believe that we cannot be too over the top in our demonstrative love for God. It's biblical. I guess some people say to me, oh, Mark, you know, we need to be respectable. Please, can you show me the verse? Please, can you show me the demonstrations in the scriptures of where respectability in our worship is given as something to be noteworthy? It doesn't exist. But I see time and time again the people of God enamored by a revelation of who he is and what he has done in our lives, that it liberates us. Paul and Silas were free before they began singing. The chains, that's not what held them. They were free. They were free in their hearts. I love meeting people who are free in their hearts. I had a, Nita and I had a, birth, a, a special sort of anniversary meal with a lovely couple in our church. He just turned 94 yesterday, or Friday actually, while we were, one of the things we did while we were stuck in traffic was that we recorded a little video for him and sent it on WhatsApp to sing and say happy birthday to him. And this man, this 94 year old, is, is buzzing with Jesus. He's buzzing with re revelation of Jesus. There's another precious lady in our church in her 60s recently went to visit her sister and suddenly she lost her eyesight on the way and she got taken to the hospital because she couldn't see through her one eye and found that she had a very severe tumor 
And right now, she's been given just a few weeks to live and she's saying, don't pray for healing for me. Don't pray for me to be healed. I'm ready to go home to Jesus. And she's rejoicing. She is excited. She's delirious. I said to her, listen, some of your family don't know Jesus. They're a little bit upset about this. They're sad. Please have a little bit of compassion for your family. And she's like, I can't wait to be with Jesus. Because she's had a revelation. She knows that he's real. She knows that she's been transformed. She knows that she's free. She's rejoicing. She's looking forward to her upgrade, to her promotion, to her glory. And there's something that happens when we know that we're free. And I think there are too many in the church today that would look at the, the chains on their arms and think, I'm bound. No, if you know Jesus, you are free. Who the Son sets free, he sets free partially, completely. Sets free completely. Don't let the world put chains on that which the Lord has put liberty upon. So halal. I don't think it's a mistake that it's the most common used word for praise in the Old Testament. Let me tell you some of the others. Tehillah. This is a singing, sometimes called the high praises of God. It often involves loud demonstrations of singing and music. It says the Lord inhabits the tehillah of his people, the singing of his people, Psalm 22. Inhabits, not visits. I don't want a visitation of God. I want a habitation of God. I don't want to say, God, would you visit your church again? Say, God, would you come and inhabit your people again? Fill us, live with us, dine with us. Relax with us in our homes, in our lives. The Lord inhabits. It's a lifestyle of welcome. The well-known worship leader from the 80s and 90s, Chris Bowater, said these words. He said, when we come together, we don't come together to worship. We are worshippers coming together. Worship is a 24-hour a day, seven day a week, activity that we live our lives in light of the king of glory when we gather together it should be explosive because God has been at work among us all week and this is our opportunity to gather with the saints and say wow wow and I have to ask the question if it's not wow then why I think we've compartmentalized God into moments We've compartmentalized him into services. And that doesn't mean to say we don't love him. But we give him his space. We give him his moments. And it means that we've lost the wow. I love that we've got people in our church that in their business, in their workplaces, in their college, in their university, that their passion and desire is to inculcate God into those moments. That any moment of the day could be a moment where God breaks through into their surroundings. But to do that, we have to be worshippers in the prisons as well as in the church buildings. That's when the wow moments come. You know, I believe the gifts of the Holy Spirit are real today. I love to speak in tongues. Paul says, there's two sort of messages about tongues in the New Testament. There's one where tongues are given in a gathering and Paul gives instruction around that and he talks about, you know, you must make sure there's interpretation at those moments. You must make sure there's order around that. Someone gives a message in tongues, then wait for the interpretation and the person who's given the message, if there isn't an interpretation, they should wait on God for the interpretation that the emphasis is on bringing an interpretation to reveal God's heart. But there's another form of tongues where Paul talks about, he said, I speak in tongues more than any of you. And he talks about it building him up. I do a lot of long journeys, as you've heard. And, you know, in those journeys, particularly when I'm traveling on my own, I'll be speaking in tongues a lot of the time. Because I want the radar of my life to be orientated towards his presence. I don't want to just listen to, to Radio 5 Live and know what's going on in the world. I don't just want to listen to an audio book and to find out the fascinating facts that the researcher of that book has created. 
Nothing wrong with those things. I don't even just want to listen to worship songs. I want to get my, the dish of my spirit and point it towards the presence of God. And I find that when I speak in tongues, it helps me do that. And I've um, been gathering our leaders a lot over, over the last few months, and I've been starting off by saying, okay, before we start our gathering, let's, let's stand, let's speak in tongues together. How long? A minute? Two minutes? Let's do 10, 15. Ooh, that's quite a long time. We had a, a Nigerian apostle come and speak to our congregation last year. Never met him before. A good friend of mine is a good friend of his. And he said to me, Mark, you must get this guy to come to the church. He'll be a real blessing to you. And so on the basis of my friendship with this guy, I said, okay, um, we'll work out a date for him to come. This guy has never spoken in a church that's, we're not, we're not a white church. We've got very mixed cultures in our church and there's lots of different nationalities in our church. And, um, but probably he was only ever used to speaking in all black churches. So it was a new experience for him. But before he came, my son said, Dad, can I, have you seen this? Can I show you something? And it was a little video clip of this man that my friend had encouraged me to book who was coming in about three weeks' time it was a little video of him speaking at a conference. And he said these words. If you have never spoken in tongues, how many hours consecutively was in he? So if you've not spoken in tongues consecutively for 10 hours, he said, you're like a joke. And he said, you're Batman because you've got all the paraphernalia of a superhero, but you don't really have any special power. And I'm thinking, oh no, I've invited this guy to the church. <laughs> and I'm thinking, i phoning my friend and saying, what have you done to me? How have you, how have you set me up like this? Because our posture is we want to encourage people to pray. We don't want them to make, make them feel guilty that they're not praying. And this guy's going to come, he's going to condemn everybody, he's going to tell them they're a joke. So um, I prayed about it before I phoned my friend and complained to him. And I felt God give me a picture of a defibrillator. And he said, when this man comes, he's going to be like a shock to the church. But he's going to bring their hearts back in line with my heart. Okay, if that's what you want, God, I'll, I'll go along with that. So he came to the church and never met him before. I'd not even spoke to him on the phone. My friend had done all the intermediary arrangements. And some of my team had shown him into my office. Well, when I get to his office, there's a cortege of about 15 people there with him as well. And I go up to him, my first meeting, and I go and shake his hand. I said, hello, Apostle Aromi Asai, my name is Batman. <laughs> and he laughed. He said, oh, you've seen the video as well. I said, I've seen the video. And I said, we need you this weekend to come and provoke us, to stir our hearts, because we've become too comfortable. Because... We get to a place where we think if we've spoken tongues for five minutes, and you might be here today, and you might think, I've never spoken tongues. I've tried, I've prayed, it's never happened. I want to encourage you to keep seeking. Because I believe it's a great resource. God doesn't condemn people who don't speak in tongues. Some of our heroes, Billy Graham out here didn't speak in tongues. Was he filled with the Spirit? Of course he was filled with the Spirit. He led millions of people to the Lord. Wonderful. But... I wish Billy Graham had spoken tongues for him because <laughs> I find it a great resource and a great blessing. And if you've never spoken in tongues, just ask God because he's a generous God and he loves to bless his people. And I believe that God is looking for us to step outside of the comfort and the ordinary into the extraordinary in him. So there's halal, there's tehillah, there's yada. Yada means to throw out your hands, to give thanks, to confess. It's not just like what you see people do at a Coldplay concert where they just put their hands up and they wave it. It's not just a physical response, although there is something about our culture that does understand that raising hands is significant. If you're in a class and a teacher asks, anybody know the answer to this question, what do you do? 
you put your hand up because you know the answer. How many of you know, no matter what the question, the answer is Jesus? So we can put our hands up. Often when I've traveled or my kids were younger and I'd return after a few days away, they'd often know, particularly if I'd been abroad, that maybe I'd buy a little gift from them from the airport. Or to be honest, I'd usually pop in Asda on the way home and get it because you get more, more to give them for cheaper. So, uh, but as they greet me on the door, they'd often put their hands up. Why were they doing that? Because they were expectant to receive something. There's something powerful about lifting your hands, you know. It's not just a charismatic culture. It's actually a biblical mandate. The church with hands raised. And also, if you're on the, on the battlefield, and you are in the presence of someone who is overpowering you, what do you do? You surrender. Raising your hands is powerful, even in our culture. But it's powerful in the scripture. To throw out your hands, to give thanks, to confess at all times for all things is powerful. And then quickly, I'm going to go through these toda. Again, it's extending the hands, but it's with a slightly different motive. It's not just you are great, but it might be I'm in the middle of an awful situation, but I believe you're going to get me through this. I'm ill and I'm sick, but I believe that you're my healer. It's prophetic. It's lifting your hands for that which you know God is, but you're not yet experiencing it's a sacrifice of praise. Barak means to bend the knee, to kneel, to bless God as an act of adoration. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Barak is holy name. Bless him. I don't know when the last time you gathered with the saints and thought, we're going to bless God today. Most of the time, I think in today's world, we think, I hope God blesses me. I'm going to go to be blessed today. But I wonder if God never gave us one more blessing ever again. And why does he need to? In Ephesians, it says, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. They've already given to us. They're already ours. They're already been achieved through the sacrifice of the Lord on the cross. If we never had one more blessing again, but every time we gathered, it wasn't about us, it was about him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And then zamar. Zamar means to play or pluck an instrument, to sing praises, to make music, to celebrate with music and song. Moses declared that God was his strength and his song, his music. He was his soundtrack. He was the sound that filled his mind. Oh, there's a lot of sounds I want to fill our minds. Some of the songs that have maybe fit in your mind might be the blues. I woke up this morning. Do, 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 do. Life was rubbish. Do, 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 do. God doesn't want the people of God to be filled with the blues. He wants to be filled with the praises of God. He wants a new song and a new sound. A song of praise to our God. And instruments are biblical. David created instruments, part of his creativity. I love creativity in the body of Christ. And then, coming towards the end, Shabbat. What does this mean? It means to shout, to address in a loud tone, to speak about God, to exclaim him. Are you imprisoned or are you free? I want to tell you, theologically, you're free. Experientially, you may feel like you're in chains. Shabbat is a revelation that no matter how we feel, that the theological truth that we are free is our reality. What happened in the walls of Jericho? They marched around seven days on the seventh day. Complete silence, by the way. And there is an appropriate place of silence. There's an appropriate time for silence, for meditation, for reflection. But make sure in your silence that you're not thinking and being distracted by other things. Make sure that you find ways of meditating on God in your silence. Because silence is not righteous. It's what we do with it that makes it righteous. But just like God loves those spaces in our life he's not 
nervous about our shouts. And the Israelites marched around six days. On the seventh day, they marched around seven times again silently. And on the seventh time, what happened? There was a shout and the trumpets blasted. And there was a declaration. And at that moment, the declaration brought the walls down. Two years ago, I was walking around those walls of Jericho, the remnants of what's left. And to think that just at the sound, and of course it wasn't the sound. It wasn't the reverberation of the audio that caused these bricks to crumble or the foundations to break. It was the power of God that was released through the sound of the people of God. And the faith that it took for them to walk around a space they'd walked around for seven days and seen nothing happen. And then suddenly they lift up a shout of victory. It wasn't just a shout. It was a shout of victory. And I believe that God is calling his church to lift up a sound of victory. Oh, we may not feel like we're many. We may feel that we're more marginalized in society than we've ever, ever been. We may feel like we don't have the resources that we'd like to have. But I believe that we can lift up a sound of victory. Praise is a lifestyle, not an act. In the midnight hour, when others seek to take your freedom, will you be locked up or will you be free? Do the prison walls seem more significant to you than your God? Day and night, prison cell or open space, good times or challenging times, God is powerful and he wants to do extraordinary things come on let's stand together let me tell you what I'm gonna what we're gonna do in our final moments together I'm gonna go back on that piano which is almost in tune do you know this because it needs you need a song that you're familiar with do you know that song all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good I saw a little clip on YouTube the other day of three people, I think in their 80s, leading worship, singing that song, and I knew it was so rich. Because they weren't singing just from hope, they were singing from experience. All my life, you have been faithful. And as we sing this, I'm not going to, say that you need to run around the room and do something over the top for God. Although that would be entirely appropriate. And maybe you want to. Maybe you want to do the risk assessment and stand on the chair and go, yes, come on Jesus. I'm a real supporter of the king. And I'm not going to let me or the world be of any ambiguity around my, uh, my allegiance to Jesus. Maybe you just want to lift your hands. Maybe you want to sing like your life depends on it. Like this is every part. This is not convenience now. This is me stepping out. And I believe as we do that, there's a significant understanding of a fresh revelation of the power and the presence of God that comes among the people of God. If you know the words, then I encourage you to not even look at the screens because sometimes that can be, that takes us into cerebral. You know, we just look at words and we read feels a bit educational and there's nothing wrong with that God's into education but maybe there needs to be something different where you become less self-conscious and you become more conscious of him so come on let's sing this Nick come and join me as well would you All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful no, all my life you have been faithful. No, my life 
you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, sing it now. All my life, all my life, you have been faithful. All my life, Lord, all my life, you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Oh, hallelujah. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Sing that again. Your goodness. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Oh, your goodness. Your goodness is running after. It's running after with my life. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after. Sing that again, your goodness. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. No. Your goodness is running after. It's running up to me with my life laid down. I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running up to me. We're going to sing that. Your goodness is running after, after me. And I'm going to encourage you. If you feel confident with this, would you just lift your hands where you are a moment? Lift them to heaven. And I want you to say something in your own words along the lines. God, I thank you that you chase after me with your goodness and your kindness. And immediately you might be thinking of your own condemnation. You might be mindful of shame. You know, the accuser of the brethren wants to keep your worship silent. He wants to make you feel like you are not worthy. I thank you, Lord, that your kindness and mercy chases us. And I thank you, Lord, that as far as the east is from the west, you have removed our sins from us. You have removed them completely from our lives, oh God. And we are the recipients of your kindness and your mercy. Hallelujah, we thank you, God. Your goodness is running after. It's running after to me your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after your goodness is running after it's running after me oh your goodness is running after it's running after to me oh your goodness your goodness is running after it's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, oh, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, then sings my soul, my Savior God. To thee, Lord, how great thou art, how great thou art, who oh, 
then sings my soul, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Let's lift our voices in thanksgiving to the Lord. Hallelujah. Clap your hands and shout for joy. Hallelujah. Come on. Worship according to the victory that's in your heart. Hallelujah. You are good. You are good. You are good, oh God. And your love endures forever. You are good. You are good. You are good, oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, shira la la sira la cola sor. La 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 sira la la se. La 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 shira la sor. Kala la 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 sira la mala la se. La 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 shiko la sor. Oh, la 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 shira la sor. La 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 sira la la se la cor. La 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 se la sor o cor. La 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 shira la sol do do. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so so good. Every breath. That I am able, I will sing of the goodness of, the goodness of, the goodness of God. Of the goodness all my life, oh Lord, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every, every breath, breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, Lord, we ask that you will help us to allow our hearts and our lives to demonstrate your glory. That we would constantly have a sound in our mouths. And in our hearts, that's a song of praise to our God. Thank you for your kindness to us, Lord. And Lord, I pray your richest blessing upon this church, on these precious people. I pray, Lord, that you will do extraordinary things with ordinary people. I pray, Lord, that wherever we find ourselves, in prison or in palaces. I pray we would be a people that lift up your name and honor your glory. And I pray that Ashbourne and the surrounding areas, when the rumors are that the church is dying, I pray there'll be a sound of life. A sound of life that rises from this church. I pray, Lord, there'll be rumors that spread in the community of signs and wonders and miracles and healings. I pray there'll be sound in the community, rumors of wisdom that goes beyond the wisdom of this world. I pray, Lord, there'll be a place of transformation and hope in many people's lives. And we pray, Lord, that Ashbourne will be saved. I pray the surrounding areas and villages and towns will be saved. 
In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Just before I hand back to Adam.